Right, I think we're good. It is empty. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to SPNP today. We're it's a bit thin on the numbers. A few, a few apologies, I believe. Is Jim coming? He's here. Okay, cool. Okay, all right. So let's um start with our <laughs> agenda. It seems very weird. It seems very empty. It's awful. Anyway, um, apologies. Um, obviously, we have them from um, Alwyn, Hazel, Andrew, and Miriata, and perhaps Jim for lateness. Oh. You're happy to move, clear? Bruce or second? Well, that's all good. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Right, moving on to the next item, disclosure of members' interests. Now, Phil spoke with me about something earlier. Way, way go, Phil. Yep, thank you. Um, so just under quarter... Oh, shit. Yeah, cool, great, thanks for that, Phil. And obviously, I don't, there's not to be any substantive discussion, so that's it. Um, thank you for declaring that. And Lou. Thank you, Lou. Any, any others? No, and they're just for noting, so we can move on then. Um, late items, I'm not aware of there being any. Nobody has anything to raise, no? Okay, we can move on. And then on to then the confirmation of the order of meeting. Don't believe we have any jiggle arounds. Lou, you're happy to move? Yep. Graham seconding, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Carried. So it takes us to the confirmation of minutes. So that's on page seven of our agenda there. Um, so we'll go flick through them, eight and nine, 10 and 11, 12 and 13, and 14. Nobody have any comments? Clear here. You're happy to move, Roger? Clear or second? All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, carried. Great, thank you. So it leads, takes us on to our first substantive item, which is the update from Sport Waikato with um, Matthew Cooper and Amy Marfell. Welcome. Kia ora, um, Council, um, Madam Chair, Susan, uh, Councillors, uh, 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 as worship for me, uh, uh, Jim and staff, uh, thanks very much on behalf of Amy Marfell for this opportunity to provide an update to Council on um, our the status of Sport Waikato. Um, as you would be aware, we um, have been working through a transformational uh, process of change at Sport Waikato over the last um, three months. Uh, pretty substantial in terms of um, the repositioning of this organisation, which is very much in line with what we believe is an organisation that needs to be fit for purpose going forward as a, a regional sports trust. Um, Council, I just wanted to just explain that this uh, transformational change was on our radar 12 months ago. Um, and that's pretty important, as I know a lot of you will be thinking change at our organisation in relation to COVID-19 around timing. Um, we were ready to push go before um, uh, before lockdown um, in terms of our change process. Um, this morning, uh, what I'd like to do is just um, make sure it works. Um, <laughs> can someone please click that for me? <laughs> Thank you. If I'm not getting much help here, uh, is it right? Okay. Thank you. There we go. There we go. Perfect. That's. <laughs> That's perfect. So, so, so Council, quickly, the purpose for today is to um, provide an update of our change. The second one is to give Council clarity around ensuring that you have confidence in, in terms of the impact we're trying to focus on why we're changing as, a, as an organisation. And the last uh, part, and I know it's obviously very important times for Council around long-term planning, so uh, is, is to give you an insight to um, the, the funding. Amy will talk to that shortly. Um, if I can change, or am I working now? Thank you. Cool, so just a reality for you council is that despite the investment and despite being quite a large organization, so Sport Waikato has got up to about 80 FTE over time. 
A lot of that's based on programs that um, uh, significant programs through the likes of the DHB, and you may have heard, I know Mike Woodoff in terms of uh, programs like Project Energize, which was a heavily resourced program. Um, lots of different programs, active and well, were in that space. Um, then, of course, there's the district coordinator model across the uh, across the region. But despite the growth of Sport Waikato over time, um, you'll see 2007 that the physical activity guidelines were 54%. Um, and over that period of time, and back into 2017 in terms of the Active New Zealand survey, where it's still at 54%. So what that tells us is that uh, generally this is, the, this, is a, this is an adult participation, which is 30 minutes a day, five days a week, um, over that particular period of time. Um, we're not seeing a massive, massive jump, and we're not satisfied that we're still around that mid-50 mark um, as an organisation. And if I look to the right, that's your, that's your numbers, and, and you'll probably be able to see on your laptops. Um, you're better. Uh, you're you're, you're str stronger here in Waipa in terms of being about 62%, if I'm reading right, Amy, um, in terms of the adult participation. It's inflated a little bit because of Cambridge, so there is a lot, there is a lot more. So we're conscious of the likes of Kihi, Kihi, Parongia, uh, Te Mutu, but there's a strong inflated in terms of the amount of activity that's mm -hmm. happening over in Cambridge, but you are higher uh, as, a, as a district compared to the actual region region number as well. Down below there is what, that, that's our youth figure of the, the Waipa District Council. So that's our youth figure, and that's looking at around about 59%. Correct, I'm just my glasses are working. Um, and But what we know, we actually know that everyone wants to do more. So adults want to do more, kids want to do more, they want to be more active. So a lot of it's around, so the demand's not the issue, it's what we're offering our, our people of YPA. So that's one real key thing. We've actually just lined up in terms of our change, a, a BHAG, a, a big audacious goal of 75% combination of adults and youth is what we want by the year 2030. So we've got one, we've put a stake in the ground pretty early in our piece of change and that's to have that big goal as well. Um, just one of the reasons we're going to really, we've tried to be a means to everyone. So Sport Waikato has got quite confused. We've tried to get into the health space. We've tried to get in, we've tried to cover all 100, 460,000 people. Um, but this is quite important. This is all around Rangatahi, which is Rangatahi is teenagers from say 12 through to 18 or 19. Now, what we are the most active, we are the most active at the age of 12. So when we're in our lifestyle, we're, we're probably the most active at age of 12. Then there's a, there's, and you can see straight away from 12 down to 17, there's a 57% drop. In fact, 17 year olds are doing 3.5 hours less activity than, than they were doing when they were 12 years old. And it never comes back. So in general terms, once you, and that's quite a concern for us, and already that's a target group for us around not only the, 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 the primary and intermediate or the five to 11, but also the, um, the, the teenagers are really important for us. Again, if you look on that right side, they want to do more. We've got a strategy and the strategy is working really well. And that was introduced in 2016. And, this, and with the strategy are three key areas. The first one's around growing participation. The second one is about developing the system, developing capability. And the last one is around partnerships. It's around intelligence, insights. So this, the strategy is good, it's solid, but it was still aligned to, uh, in terms of our substantial change that's happening now, there were still some uh, existing programs which were very much around delivery. Um, this change council will see this organization 50% smaller. So we have, uh, we will basically be an organization the size of about mid 40s rather than 80s. So that's where we're at at the moment in terms of our transformational change of Sport Waikato. Um, the new way of working will see a clear vision. So the vision is about, we want everyone moving, but we will be very targeted in the, in the zero to 18 space with a lens on up to 24 for female. We, our, our, why do we exist? We're going to exist to increase the physical activity levels of people in our region. How are we going to do it? By providing high valued strategic re regional leadership. We need to get, to get momentum. We need to get the right people at the right level to, a, to actually have those discussions with the leaders, with the Gary Diets, with the Shelleys, with the Debs. That's where we need to be having those discussions. We need to affect policy. It's no point us running around in cars with a lot of cones. There's a lot of organisations that do that. We've got to try and affect change at a higher level for sport, recreation and play. 
And to do that, we want to be an organisation that's influencing the play active rec and sports system and not necessarily doing the delivery. In our research for change, there are over a thousand deliverers in the Waikato region. There are over a thousand organisations that deliver. That's the likes of, say, Waikato Rugby. That's the likes of Kelly Sport. That's the likes of YMCA. There's lots of deliverers, but there's not that one regional agency for play, active rec and sport that actually improves the system, uh, that affects policy, affects change. And to do that, we've got to have the right, uh, right people. Now I'm going to pass over to Amy, who's going to say, what does it mean to WIPA? What does it mean to you in terms of the historic model that we've had before? So in terms of our change, you'll all be familiar with the historic district coordinator model that we've had for many years. So largely it's been the siloed district bound FTE that's worked, I guess, in some ways in a limited capacity with council. There is differences across the districts and the ways that the district coordinators work, but largely it's been a public facing role. So we've had an office in town, the public has largely come in and engaged with our district coordinator. The contracts that we've had for the district coordinators with council have been a bit of a hybrid of delivery and influencing. So there's been um, some things in there around supporting events and delivering activations or classes or programs. Um, nutrition outcomes have been a focus and connecting participants to activity has been another, I guess, key KPI for those roles. Uh, there's been some difference again across the uh, across the district, sorry, in terms of um, strategy and plans. Um, so those roles have in some ways supported the formation and implementation of district sport and active recreation plans. And we have those with a number of councils, but it's often not been the largest focus of the role. And sometimes those plans haven't been really driven by the district coordinator. Um, the district coordinator has also been the connector of other subject matter experts from Sport Waikato into the district. So in terms of sport development, sport capability and insights. So where we're shifting is to a new regional connectivity coordinator model, which is looking at less of the siloed and district bound role and more of a uh, role that works across district boundaries. So for this particular district, we've bundled um, a partnership with Waikato District Council and Hamilton City Council. And the idea is to work closely in and with those councils and in and with those districts to drive some key outcomes. The roles will be focused on strategic leadership and in particular leading that sport and active recreation plan. So that plan is based on need, it's based on data and analysis of what should be a priority in terms of sport, active rec and in some districts play. Um, so that's gonna be a really key document in terms of driving the work plan of that role. Um, sometimes we have had in our districts a bit of a focus on the loudest voice, but the plan really helps us to understand what is actually needed. What does participation and demographic trends tell us we need to do in the sport and rec space to help people to be more active? There's also a significant focus in the roles in terms of leading local facilities projects. So that has again been a small part of the district coordinator role in the past, but where we see some real value and some real need in the sector, particularly post COVID is in that local facilities um, space. And that could be in terms of physical hubbing, but it could also be in terms of virtual hubbing, i.e. bringing sports together to make sure that they're sustainable and more efficient and better catering to the participants' needs. There's also an opportunity for that role to support uh, cross-boundary projects and conversations. So the reason that we've bundled the three councils is that there is already that cross-boundary uh, conversation happening, but what we'd really like to do is to support to increase those outcomes. One of the key changes in terms of the role is that they don't work in the delivery space anymore. So as Matthew mentioned, as an organisation, we have stepped away from the delivery space because there are a number of deliverers out there. So instead, our focus switches from supporting the deliverers to deliver in a way that meets the participants' needs rather than just being a great deliverer. Um, there will also be a maintenance of the important work that we've done in terms of this role with su supporting the sector, the local sector, so supporting the local sport, active recreation and potentially play organisations in the district. And this role will be a subject matter expert in their own right, so they will be able to support in the insight space rather than just relying on other members of our organisation. So those are the key changes in terms of the historic role to the new role. So what you'll see in the district, you'll see the likes of Matthew and I in terms of speaking with you all and providing high value strategic leadership. 
You'll also see insights. So the district profiles that we've um, been able to provide, we're committed as an organisation to continuing to provide district level insights. Historically, there's been a focus on regional insights, which aren't always that helpful when trying to look at your specific locality. But as an organisation, we're committed to making sure that you have the insights about your specific district to be able to make decisions. And just, just on that council, the, um, the Act of New Zealand Data Sport New Zealand Fund, um, 500 adults across each region and 180 kids. Um, that's the and that's so that's in Hawke's Bay, that's in Manawatu. It's not it's not big enough. And so what we did is we upsized in 2017 to 500 adults in Waipa and 180 youth in Waipa. So we've done that right across our district. So we've gone for 5,000 and 1,800 youth. So we've got some really better we've got better data. Yeah, and on top of that, we're also working really hard in the secondary school space to make sure we've got voice at Angatahi data, which gives us that youth voice where Matthew talked about that significant drop off. So we're not just relying on the 180 in terms of youth figures. We're actually, I think we've got about 700 extra youth um, across the region and we're continuing to work in that space to really understand that drop off. Facilities or spaces and places planning support will continue to be a focus for us, both with the regional plan, but also in the local settings as well. We'll have a secondary schools team who will work with the secondary schools to support better quality experiences in sport and active recreation for teenagers. Coaching teams, so that's a really big focus for us when we look at the reasons why young people are dropping out. Often it's not, or well, it's a lack of quality coaching or they don't feel that coaching's meeting their needs. So that's a significant focus for us moving forward. This is me who's already been in the district and we will continue to activate women and girls. Sports sector support will continue, the COVID-19 recovery support as well as innovation support. So how are we helping the local sector to innovate? Sports been the same way for a number of years and it's currently not meeting the needs of the participants. So what might need to change and how can we help to have those conversations? As well as healthy active learning. So that's work with primary schools. So healthy active learning is a national initiative, a partnership between the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Ed and Sport NZ. So it largely targets uh, the HPE curriculum and sport, uh, supporting primary schools to deliver quality HPE for young people. <laughs> so the change model you see that sport by Kato staff influence the system. So we're part, part to increase the quality of delivery. So that's all around there. Sport by Kato staff will work closely with council staff. Um, we will step away from, from delivery and it's a, it's a dissolution. We're going to move away from the silo district-based model. So in terms of the, the, the focus, you'll just see it. It's more about us being an organisation that's going to focus on influence. Remember council, there are very good delivery organisations here in, in Waipa. We want to work very closely with them as well. And to, to what this means in terms of what we, um, in terms of our, I suppose, request for consideration, a, a decrease in uh, historic investment per annum of 74,868 uh, to, to uh, 50,000 per annum is where Sport by Hutter. So, what that does do, I suppose, and that's all due to more budgeting, but that does uh, release some funds that, if delivery is still important, um, and I do want to also signal to council that there is a new fund out of Sport by uh, out of Sport New Zealand that we, we manage, which is called To Manawa. Some of you would have remembered the old Kiwi Sport Fund. That's been, so that's a fund which has to go into delivery. So, straight away, I see potentially council. If, if a delivery is really important, knowing that this organization is reshaping itself, repurposing itself to be an influencer at the high level for sport, recreation and play, um, there are options there um, through you, um, Susan, there are options. So, yeah, so that's the, that's the in terms of the funding, um, uh, the funding model. And that concludes our presentation, Council. Oh, thank you, um, Matt and Amy. Um, not often we have people come in or organisations come and ask for less, so that's quite refreshing. But obviously, you've um, this isn't you know knee jerk reaction to, to um, financial constraints, which is good to see. You know, something you've been considering as an organisation for some time. Questions or um, comments for um, these two, Marcus? I think it's a really great change, and going towards lobbying and getting you know having input into our plans and things and helping us recycle ways and support things that we need. I think it's um, yeah, I think it's really exciting. Thank you. There, there has been some uh, impact on our funding model. It's uh, not, uh, and that came through the 
with the DHB and has been a program that Councillor Pettit's been involved with for a long time in terms of Project Energise, um, which has been substantial um, over 16 years. Uh, yep, uh, we, as we know, the DHB under a bit of heat, so we did lose quite a, quite a we lost 50%, so we lost a million dollars out of the DHB. So we had to react. Uh, I don't believe we could continue coming to our councils right across where we've had nine district coordinators and continually um, had this, the same model there uh, where we're getting an FTE. I think over time, I think legitimately, we would have got questions from our councils. Um, so we believe that this high level approach, borderless approach across is a better way to go at a, at a high at a strategic level. Mm, yeah, definitely. Claire, did you have a question? Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, I think the changes that, that you're suggesting are pretty exciting and I wish you yeah, success with it. Um, I had a question about the innovation, you know, like you're saying the existing model doesn't work that well and that we've got a lot of people, young people that would like to be more active, but then they're, they're struggling to do it. Um, yeah, I just wonder if you had any other sort of ideas that you're sharing that, that, that you could share about that other innovations that might be possible. Yeah, so we've already started a little bit, work, a little bit of work, and um, obviously my power have been a part of it in terms of the season transition plan. You know, so there's a, there's a, I guess a historic way of doing sport, which kind of comes from industrial times that we don't live in anymore. We still make kids play twenty odd weeks of whatever code it is, and they're they're telling us we've got all the data that tells us that basically it's not working for them. So it's about us having conversations with the codes and being able to influence you could still have a 20 week season, but you could break it in half so that kids could commit to 10 weeks of rugby and then maybe they want to go and play 10 weeks of hockey somewhere else. So it's about how we can actually make sport a little bit different. It doesn't necessarily completely need to be blown to bits, but we need to kind of understand what are the pinch points for people. And it's not just young people, it's working people as well. How can we have more informal and pop-up options that people can access rather than having to commit for long periods of time, those sorts of things. Straight, straight after COVID and when we re-engaged, it was re really interesting, Council, some of the regional sports um, straight away said, uh, you now what are you going to do? You've got a, you've got, we've, we're back in now. There's a whole lot of, it's a different world now. And straight away, they first thing they did that we're going, we've still got to have 22 weeks, but we're going to play right into November. We're going to have 22 weeks. Now, part of that was the only reason they wanted 22 weeks was that's the financial model to try and make them survive. So there's something wrong because what they're saying is financially, their motivation was to have 22 weeks winter sport going into the middle of November. And it was around their financial model. So that mm. to me suggests that are you thinking about the actual kids? <laughs> Uh, have we got the right? Have, have we got the right model here? And, and so that was really that was a light bulb to us to say, look, um, and we want to work. We're not we're not criticising them. That's what they've done, but we need to do things differently. You know? And as Amy said, maybe a child wants to play. I don't know, 10, 10 weeks of rugby, and maybe he wants to play ten uh, five weeks of football. So we're trying to change that dynamic as well, so, mm. or that just that thought pattern. Mm -hmm. Jim. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, look, this might be um, displaying my age a little bit, but, um, you know, we're, we're now working into a situation where, heaven forbid, we've got to feed kids at school. Um, and, and I just wonder when you see the drop off that's, that's happening between primary um, and secondary schools, um, whether that's um, compulsion at the Ministry of Education level is appropriate, where sport is, is seen as a, sport and recreation a far more important part of their, their education program, and, and actually uh, making it compulsory uh, again back at schools to do, you can, you've got a captive audience, and, and if people are forming their, um, their life skills, I suppose, at that level, and, and the way they're likely to react when they leave school, then getting them engaged at school where you've got them captive for five days a week uh, seems to me that it's a, an opportunity that we're missing. And I know it's going going backwards and we want to give kids more choice, but at some point uh, they've got to be educated that that active recreation is, is important for their life skills. So is there any work being done back with the ministry to, to work on that? 
Matt, could I just interrupt for a minute and get you to press your button? I think we know that the, um, the, the kids want to do more. So, so we know and the, the data science around about late 50s in terms of uh, uh, role. I think the danger, uh, Mayor Jim, if, if you tell them they have to play, if you say that you, uh, we, we know ultimately we want to create a lifelong experience. We know that only 2% will ever play, I suppose, representative sport or, or even higher in terms of high performance sport. So there's that 98% that we want to try and create a, a fun, enjoyable experience. It's actually, a, it's good fun to play. There are some good learnings, and I totally agree with you, Jim, that the, the learnings of teammates, camaraderie, absolutely. But if we're telling them, and if we say to a child that you have to play sport at secondary school summer and you have to play a winter sport, I guarantee by 18 or 19, they'll throw it, throw it away because they haven't really enjoyed that experience. I'm not talking about the top players. So that's the, it's, that goes back to we've got to be participant-centric going forward uh, in terms of ensuring that we are listening to what meets their needs as well, rather than that traditional saying that you must play. Um, I think maybe certainly under Mike's leadership at primary, it's a little bit of a different cohort where sometimes you tell them to do this, they'll say, how high do you want me to jump? But at secondary school level, it's it's slightly different. So that's where we're, we're working really closely at the moment. I acknowledge it's different. I was chairman of the board of Te Amuru College for 12 years. And when kids arrived at the college, they just stopped playing sport. You know, um, when the, the swimming sports used to be on, everybody at the school had to, had to enter three events. Um, re more recently, nobody... Mm joined in at all and I understand why people don't necessarily want to get into their togs in front of the whole school but um, and and we are providing more choices because it used to be rugby soccer and hockey and cricket in the, in the summer so that there's a whole lot more choices but at some point those habits have got to be formed and if you leave it to choice we all say we want to do more but we just don't so you need someone with a stick Mike. <coughs> Mike, and then yep, through the chair, thank you. Thanks for your presentation to so far. Um, I'm going to take task with some of it though. Um, look, if I look at that, that data where 81 percent of children are um, uh, actively involved at the primary level, and look, and I've talked to a lot of my colleagues, there's a lot of angst out there um, of what you're doing that's affecting the primary sector, I guess primary and intermediate sector, which is where this drop off isn't happening. Um, I guess I also take task with the whole concept of um, there's not a system in place at the moment where kids are playing multiple sports because sports are working together. And more importantly, sports working together, coaches are working together and working out because it's all about trainings, it's not just about nights. So, and as Jim's mentioned, it's not just about, you know, rugby, hockey, netball, and football, there's so many other sports that have come into play. And I look at our school and the amount of children, and Cambridge might be standing out, I don't know, but the amount of children playing sport and multiple sports, not just one sport in winter or one sport in summer, multiple sports because they've got the training, they've got the coaching, but in the schools, um, the um, Project Energize staff have made a massive impact. And like, we're pretty devastated to be losing them. Um, and if it's just funding based, you know, look, if you went to the principals, I'm sure they'd like it revisited and to see if we can find the money from somewhere. I understand that you've lost half the money from the DHB um, and they've got reasons obviously for that to have happened. But the shortfall, I think the impact could be a lot, you know, we're basically leaving you guys to get it right. And if you get it wrong by 2030, well, it's too late for all the kids you've impacted. So to me, the risk is, um, I can't support the risk, and um, um, a lot of my colleagues can't either. So the rest of it, I support. But at that primary level, getting rid of those folks, and that's that doing, not the planning, not the <coughs> influencing. There's real concern out there. Um, thanks. Thanks, Mike. A um, couple of things. Um, Energize itself, 16 years. The last evaluation was in 2011 on Project Energize. Um, the 
the model itself had 25 staff of all varying varying um, skill set. Um, in fact, we only were able to, in terms of the model of funding, we could only we only actually had three or four qualified teachers out of that 25. So for us to be having people going into your setting, teaching in curriculum time, which a lot of them were, was an unsustainable model um, in terms of that. We also have issues around that uh, certainly some schools have far more um, support um, through, through, their, through their strength and decile than a lot of other schools. And the majority of schools, if I could say uh, the impact on some of the schools that are very low decile rating, would suggest that we've got to have a different approach. Um, and I'm talking schools and the likes of Tikawiti, Huntley, Narawa here, Energise was not having the impact and the quality of delivery from the Energizer respectfully wasn't at the standard that probably you've received. So we had, a, we had, to, do, we had to fix the model. We had to fix them all. Yeah. Um, I think it's also really interesting when you think about um, in the primary school setting that the immediate impact that this had when you see children running around and it's wonderful. But if you take it from 15 years ago and you now look at those kids as adults and you look at our adult stat, it probably hasn't had the impact that we maybe all thought it might in terms of physical literacy, in terms of that lifelong engagement and movement. So from our perspective, there's something that really needs to be done and it's not just about providing kids with on-the-spot activity it's about how we can work with them to embed that physical literacy and that comes largely data has found through HPE that's one of the main ways that kids develop in terms of physical literacy so there's a need to really shift the focus from physical activity to physical education yeah so the, the, the one of the problems here is there is hardly any training at the, at the training level for these teachers, right? Mm. So the training happens with folks like you provide. Now, when you get one-offs from um, Waikato cricket and rugby and football, and you get those people in as one-offs, and that's all it is, just one-off. There's no relationship really, because it's just one-off. It might be a relationship from year to year. What you develop with your project energy staff, and to me, from what I've heard, it's not a systems problem, it's a people problem, which is a management problem. If your people aren't performing, you've got to get rid of them. But at that relationship, it's more than just the coaching. It's, it's actually all that relationship and stuff that your staff are doing, whether they're supposed to or not, um, helping organise and just give support to, um, I guess, structural organisation within communities around sports. And I, get, I, I can't talk for other communities, but I just know how much influence the guys have over in Cambridge um, to so many children. And nationwide, we are getting fatter and we are getting more unproductive. You guys are holding your ground here. Holding your ground, I think, is actually, in this world, actually really good. And if that stat goes backwards at primary, um, because the engagement goes down or the activity goes down because teachers aren't trained as much and all the rest of it, it's easy to kick things like PE to touch, so, so to speak, because it's a cr curriculum so crowded. I mean, back in the day of doing two skill sessions in a game, those days are gone in most schools now. It is, you are trying to fit activeness into a school, a crowded school curriculum. And if there's excuses out there for teachers not to do it, believe you me, they'll take it. And, um, and if the leadership isn't there and that connection isn't there with the people that can deliver the PD, I just see quite big risk. Just to conclude um, through you, Chair, um, uh, yeah, Mike, you, you've, you've raised a point of concern in terms of your profession and, um, and, uh, and certainly respect that. Um, but I think um, an organisation that had had to, it had to doing the same thing and continually doing exactly the same model after 16 years. Um, whilst you mentioned it's uh, your view was it's a people problem, I still think it is probably a bit of both. I think it's also a system problem when over three years at the University of Waikato, the teaching for a PE is only two days. So there's only two days teaching for a person at, at the University of Waikato around physical education. It's not good enough. So in terms of influence, that's certainly an area that we need to try and focus on with the uh, Ministry of Education around what is being taught, how important do they place the importance of physical education alongside what Mike says is full on at the moment, numeracy and literacy. So we've got to get that balance right when our teachers are coming out of university as well. 
So, yeah. Thanks, Mark. Liz and then Bruce, did you have a comment? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Matt. This, this is a real brave move, isn't it? I mean, I can imagine, you know, this is this is difficult for everyone simply because this the old model has been around for such a very long time and we've all grown relationships with, you know, with your staff and with your team. But look, Matthew, you're right. Things have to change and you've seen it. You're on the ground. You, you know your business. Your team know your business. So, um, you know, it's, it's a brave move, but... I just, you know, have to put my support behind it and know that you know what you're doing, your team know what you're doing. And yeah, let's just see what the future holds. So look, best of luck. I hope it all goes well. Um, you know, it, it, there's lots of unknowns and I, and I know that and even in Cambridge and Tiamutu, there are, there, there's, un, there's, there's, some, there's, there's some worry out there about these changes, but that's inevitable. So um, yeah, let's just see how it goes and look forward to your next visit. Um, my question is relating to peer pressure, um, and it was quoted to me, like some sports take all day, some don't, and this young, this youth said to me, well, I'm playing cricket, and he was very talented, between the 15 to 20 area, he said, all my mates are surfing, and he, and he dropped out of that cricket era, and when he should have been, if he wanted to carry on, and I, do, I don't know how you deal with that, because his mates were doing something that took a lot less time, and and commitment, I suppose, but I don't know how you deal with it. I think there's there's two parts to that. The first part would be around, I guess, as long as a young person's being active, then that's okay. Whether they drop out of cricket to do surfing or the other way around, I think you know we would be okay with that because they've found some form of movement. The other thing is, is you've hit the nail on the head. You know, cricket's one of those traditional sports that takes all day, and young people want short, sharp, and we don't offer them that. So. That's the thing is that codes need to take stock and, and look at, you know, yes, they might have a player base, but how much more could they have if they offered alternative versions of their sport? It's not about wiping all day cricket, but what are the shorter, sharper formats that could be introduced for those kids that don't want to play all day? You know, I think in Matt's day and when I was playing cricket and Matt was more of the rugby, um, we, it was fun. It's, it's more serious now and, yeah. and, and you've got to play, you can't play as many sports if you want to be good. Absolutely. So it's a tricky part. Yep, absolutely. That, and that's this whole area of the, it's getting lower and lower now in terms of the importance of um, somebody needs to make a decision. So a 13 or a 14 year old having to decide. Um, and you certainly going back to um, when we played, um, you, had, you could play lots of options. You had lots of choices, which was quite good as well. But uh, uh, council, I just, just, just wanted you to know that, yep, I, there, there is, there is people watching us. There is nervousness. Uh, we understand that. Um, we've we've made a we've made a, a decision that uh, we believe this is the best way forward. Time will tell, um, and and and, uh, and I respect your, your your views, Mike. Time will tell. Um, I I just want you to know that what we have done is aligned all our funders, um, the likes of Trust Waikato, Sport New Zealand significantly. Um, any any our, our different funding sources, all our councils are aligning to one unified focus around this this new way forward. So that's a lot better than what we've historically had when we've had to actually negotiate separate outcomes for separate funders for different outcomes. So now we've actually pulled the funding together to be really focused, and it's all about getting more um, WIPA people moving. So the other funders that are coming in are helping support the WIPA model as well. So I just wanted you to know that it's a, it's a lot more aligned or tidier than it used to be. Great, thank you very much for that. Oh, Roger. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Matt. I've got to express the same kind of difference in generation as uh, Mayor Jim does. Yeah. But um, I suppose I've been fortunate that both my family, plus my grandchildren, are all sportsmen and representative sport. But even with them, the screen time is something that is an influence that is, and I don't know how you compete against that because a number of kids that go home and they're automatically onto screens rather than when I was a child, we didn't have that. We were getting outside and playing in the streets and annoying the neighbours and all those kind of things, which was great, you know, but it's a different environment. And how the heck you get away from that influence of screen and get them out there doing things. And so I applaud the way in which you're looking at different ways in which you may influence behaviour. So very much 
uh, supportive of you. I can't say whether it's going to be right or not, but I, I support your attempt to try. I just respond to that. Like um, my son's really into gaming, and he said that um, there's a movement about trying to, I don't know, incorporate physical activity with online gaming. Yeah, and um, there's a lot of interest in that because hardcore gamers do know that they should be more active. And I think there's a lot of interest in how you could combine the two, yeah, to create something really exciting. Yeah, so I really hope that you might be able to pick that up and do something with that. Interesting concept there. Right, any other comments or questions for our Lou? Yeah, thank you very much, Matt. I've seen you quite a number of times over the years. Um, I just want to relate to a point. My own daughter is actually a sports master down at Tiamaga College. And she said motivation is the biggest problem. Um, the, the average person feels uh, challenged when they go out and play sport with someone who's, as you say, in that top two to three or four percent. And that's what everyone focuses on. But a lot of people just want to go out and participate. And, and, and at multiple sports. And I mean, she's tried all sorts of things, even indoor bowls or bowls and all sorts, to try and get people to just do something to interest them. And she finds it, finds it very, very difficult with the timeframes at Microsoft, with curricular timeframes that we all have, at, whether it's at primary or at college. And that makes it very, very difficult. And she was saying that there, there is a very great difficulty to get that motivation level. And she said whether they use something like media or something like this to get out and create something that gives them a models. Because we used to play lots of things like touch rugby. Uh, we used to have twilight cricket and all sorts of things that we used to organise. These things have failed a little bit in recent years. And I wonder also about the impact of finances. Um, a lot of people and parents don't have the funds to supply that tennis racket, that cricket bat, whatever it is, you know, lacrosse whatever it just wonder on those a little and, and you're a really good point and that's one thing that uh, we've looked at too is the the affordability to play and the affordability to and uh, there are conversations that we're having at the moment with trust waikato with gallagher uh, with peris uh, with momentum waikato at the moment around how do we create some form of full pool or fund that supports uh, a voucher type system that could allow um, might be through code or might be through school to allow um, the actual ability to play and also have the equipment to play uh, more accessible. So that's a separate piece of work we're doing at the moment. Yeah, cool. okay. Thank you. Well, on the assumption there are no further questions or comments, look, thank you very much for your report. Um, challenging times ahead and clearly a brave um, um, change for you to, to instigate. So best of luck. I have um, an on our agenda there at page 15, a recommendation to um, accept and receive your report. Claire's happy to move, Bruce or second. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thanks very much. Look forward to seeing you again soon. So moving on then to our next agenda, agenda item. Uh, it's a Lake Tiku to concept plan. Tofik, welcome back. So we're on page 17 of our agenda. Oh, and Anna. Good morning. Morning, everyone. I'm here to present a brief overview of the community feedback, uh, as well as a uh, staff re recommendation to address some of the key concern that came out from the public consultation process. During uh, Cambridge Town concept plan refresh, uh, the community identified the need to improve the lake water quality as well as identify the history and the connection of the place as the top priority. Keeping that in the mind with partnership with our Mana Penwa and uh, a discussion with our key stakeholder, we developed the concept plan to provide a more coordinated stage approach to address those concerns. Uh, we went out on public consultation on 18th of May. We increased the time of public consultation from four weeks to eight weeks in response to COVID-19. During that period, we got 220 responses. Most of them were online responses. As you can see on the figure on the right-hand side, 49% of people love the plan. 
42% like the plan, but want some changes overall community. Love this coordinated or uh, joint coordinated approach to uh, address some of the key concerns surrounding with the like. As part of the concept plan, I'm sorry about that. This is really, yeah, not that common. Yeah, it didn't came out that great. But uh, as part of the consultation process, the concept plan identifies some of the key proposal and we wanted the community feedback on what proposal they like. So the more uh, the majority, uh, love, or the majority of the, uh, the proposal uh, community love the uh, proposal re related to improving water quality. Uh, the highest le level of support was given to. Oh, I can see uh, improving the uh, lakeside uh, lake edges by indigenous uh, planting. The second highest level of support was given to uh, restoring and maintaining all the heritage features. However, all key proposals received the support in range of 37 to 64%. So we got really good response to each of the key proposals. As part of the consultation, we also asked the community if there's some of the key aspect uh, of the concept plan they don't like. So we do uh, got some concerns regarding that. So on the x-axis, these are the number of responders to each individual concern. Uh, so 42, uh, 42 responder out of 220, that's like 19% of responder didn't like the proposed children's playground. Uh, 23 uh, responder after 220. So there's like around 15% of people didn't like the, uh, had concern about the meeting place and its locations. Then other concerns, including the proposed uh, underplanting of exotic with the natives. There were some concerns about the, uh, with the cost as well as the accessibility, accessibility of the reserve for the wheelchairs. So in next few slides, I will be addressing those concerns and our recommendation in associated with that. So the first one is Mara Hupara play trail. So it was, uh, it's a proposed uh, children's playground, more like a natural playground. Some of the concern that was raised is the, uh, the brightly colored playground in, uh, equipment will detract from the natural beauty of this place. The second uh, uh, were concerned that because they, uh, this is a dog off leash area, there's visitors exercising their dogs. So there might be a potential conflict with it. However, in the concept plan, the, we are proposing the playground to be a natural playground made of uh, the material would be the log and timber, so we won't have any brightly colored equipment. So it won't uh, detract from the natural beauty and the nature and scale of the playground would be, so it integrate with the surrounding environment. The play, we are, we are proposing uh, the uh, children's playground is already a favorite uh, picnic spot. So there could be a potential uh, in future to have some sort of a temporary dog restriction that no, kids, uh, no dogs are allowed on the playground. So uh, with keeping that in mind, we are not proposing any change uh, in the draft plan with regards to the Marahupara Prairie Trail. Second one is the meeting place. So again, the concern with this man-made structure will again reduce the visual amenity of this place. Uh, in the draft concept plan, we initially had that there's a potential opportunity to have a cafe associated with the meeting place. However, there was some concern raised regarding that as well. So to address those concerns, we are proposing to move the meeting place towards the to uh, more like the toilet area is indicated by the blue circle. So what it, that would be doing is moving away from the main walkway track and with more uh, near the toilet area, so it has an opportunity to integrate with the surrounding environment as well. Again, and we also removing our reference to a potential cafe because the nearby Lakewood development will already have those things, so we don't really need a cafe there. Next up is the uh, proposed underplanting of exotics. So, in as part of the terrace back restoration, the draft concept plan proposes that that exotic uh, existing exotic tree should be underplanted with the uh, natives gradually in stage so over time when the exotic uh, trees come to the end of their life life, uh, life lifespan we have a self sustaining native forest there was some concern that when doing uh, when we are uh, doing the underplanting there could be a damage to exotic uh, existing exotic trees 
they were also concerned that that will take away from the vision created by the early European settlers and the existing voluntary group. Uh, in response to that, or what we are proposing that any underplanting that uh, uh, would be taken in the future needs to be in consultation with an arborist to prevent any dangers, uh, any danger, uh, any harm to the existing exotic. Another thing is uh, in the draft concept plan, we propose an underplanting uh, exotic with the natives to balance the ex existing exotic and those native would be naturally occurring that area as well. So with regards to that, we are not uh, proposing any changes. Next one was the accessibility. This concern was raised that the current tracks is too rough for the wheelchair and the walkers. To address those concerns, we are amending, we are proposing to amend the draft plan to achieve a better accessibility from the car plugs to some of the key destinations. So first one would be increasing the mobility park. I think currently there's only one mobility park. Second, with the improved tra track maintenance and have a better track connectivity and any new future developments such as meeting place, we, uh, we would ensure that it would be accessible to the wheelchairs as well. Next up is the cost. There was some concern raised regarding the cost associated with the implementation of the of project that came out of the draft concept plan. To address it, uh, first we are recommending to remove the time frame from all uh, from the action plans. So, so initially, we had the project categorized as a short term, medium term, and long term. So we are remo removing those time frame as it will be worked through the council budget process. And uh, we are also uh, draft concept plan will have an emphasis on uh, partnership with the community because this is such an important topic with the community. So we are uh, we are proposing to have. Uh, uh, using the community and existing voluntary, uh, volunteering group to uh, implement the vegetation strategy. We will also seek the external funding. Last one is the sign. So as part of the uh, draft concept plan on legend 23 and 24, there are a number of places we are proposing the signs. So there was some concern that with uh, this many number of the sign, it will create a sign pollution and will reduce the visual amenity. Uh, what we are proposing uh, in the draft concept plan that number location and the size of signs would ensure that it is in integrated again with the surrounding environment. So it won't be too detracting for the visitors. So we, uh, there's some minor amendments in relation to this. As part of uh, the consultation, we also ask community to uh, identify the key project they want to prioritize during the short and medium term. So community want us to prioritize groundwater daylighting planting, Western Lake wet wetland, as well as uh, improving the lake outfall structure and, and planting. However, we had a discussion with our Manapenua and with the council budget process, with the ongoing council budget process, we are pro proposing uh, some amendment to uh, these priorities. And we are proposing that we should prioritize Manapenua Eastern Gateway. The second would be Western Lake Wetland Feasibility Study. And the third one is groundwater daylighting and planting to balance the water quality issue as well as restoring the uh, Manapenua identity history and the cultural of that place. Thank you. So, Fik, um, I'm really pleased to see that you know this that the community has actually been heard, and I, I don't I mean in a facetious sort of way, but um, quite often we're accused of not listening to what um, the community said, and obviously there's a lot of passion held around both these parks, and um, and I, I really like the way that you've managed to listen and incorporate a, you know feasible and practical changes. So, well done, Roger. Yes, through you, Chair Susan. I'd just like to endorse your comments. I think the good thing about uh, this whole concept was the high level of community support that it's got, because as we all know, the community has been looking for something to be done with Lake Tekuutu for a number of years, a number of years. But it's good that you have recognized the, the feedback that you've got from the community and tried to mitigate some of the issues that they saw. So that of course will increase the support because you'll have met some people's concerns. So well done on that. Um, 
the, the last slide which I'm looking at on the presentation is obviously the stormwater impact and certainly the trying to mitigate the impact of that stormwater is I think one of the critical issues of the future of Lake Te uh, So it would be great if you could give us some idea of you know what you're going to do in implementation of that in terms of your priorities. So I think uh, with the lake, the stormwater, the actual running up from the uh, uh, the roads and stuff, this is going to be a wider council-wide project. So our uh, uh, waters would be looking at the stormwater management because as part of this concept plan, we are only focusing on the uh, lake area and the reserves surrounding that area. And it doesn't give us that much chance to treat the stormwater before it's coming to the lake. However, the waters again would be working to uh, do some sort of stormwater management. So treat that uh, any input that coming from the road right now before it gets into the lake. Okay. But I hope it's gonna be integrated and in, you know, with the whole of the lake take out to concept plan for future because if we, you know if we don't do one there's little point in us doing the other to be honest yes i think De debbie has some time um so if, if you remember when we um introduced this concept plan when it first came out i did mention at that time that waters do have a project and they will be lining the timing up with this project and yeah. um, we would need dawn to come and speak to the detail of that if you wanted more detail but i'm happy to arrange that could it, if you could would like do that yeah because that would I be great that. especially yeah. seeing as we've got this in front of our eyes now it'd be great to know what the yep. waters approach is as well yep no problem thanks thanks um, graham and then mike yeah i couldn't go past lake tikarutu after having uh, seven terms onto council and going through the third report and i i really am serious i don't want to see this come before the council in the next 20 years we can fine tune i think as we go without going through this expensive process and just um there are several things that i would like um our staff to have a look at uh, and you may need some politicians involved in this. I would like to see some funding source from the Waikato River Authority. Um, I don't see Lake Tikuutu as any different to a funding for a peat lake. Um, it is known as the, as the wash bowl going back in history. And I think it's got some importance there that, that Iwi would be keen to actually um, do. But as I say, you might have to get some politicians involved in that. The second thing is, and I briefed to a feet this morning, because I went to get my car cleaned <laughs> at BP and there was a line. I went up at quarter past five the other morning because there was no line to get my car cleaned. And I'm sitting there in the car cleaner and the commercial cleaners that are cleaning the good union are tipping their filthy black water into the catch pits on the side of the road. That is going in. I don't want to make that public, but I think we need to go and talk to those people about what they're doing. They should be going into the wastewater system. Um, what I would like to see happen around the lake, and it is, they do have it at Taupo, is some fish um, um, put on the catch pits to indicate that that water, wastewater, that rainwater is going into a water body. I don't think it would be hugely expensive, but it does give an indication in today's society that we are trying to um, let, uh, you know, move things up and it would be helpful, I think. We, how many catch pits um, would be involved, I don't know, but I don't think it's huge. So um, yeah, just a couple of um, just a couple of things that I'm quite passionate about. But yeah, love working with your Tofik, and um, yeah, you're, you're such a, a bright, sparkly guy, and and you've done a great job. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Graham. Yeah. Mike. Yeah. <clears throat> um, good comments there, Graham. Um, we we've, we've done it with just with paint as well. You know, turtles and and fish and that sort of thing to show exactly the same thing. So. Um, yeah, it's a really good concept. Hey, just wondering about the parking, and I did see, a, I think I've got the data here, but there was a graph in there about how many people drive there, and at this point it's still significant, of just how much, uh, whether it would be worth looking and extending that bottom car park, which of course is the only easily accessible area that's flat um, directly to the lake, extending it into the sort of, um, into the green area, into the you know, towards the trees, but I say six meters to get two lots of angle parking rather than just the single straight parking at the moment. Um, it would double the parking down there. I know um, for the foreseeable future, we're still using vehicles and increasing with an aging population, um, people are going to find it easier to access that fantastic amenity from flat land. So maybe not a great cost, but maybe looking at doubling up the parking and just as a concept. 
Uh, thank you for the comment. I think one of the key aspirations we were trying to achieve with the draft concept plans to promote using sustainable transport. Uh, and as part of the feedback, I think 45% of people still are using the bike and scooting the alternate transport coming to the lake. So uh, I, I like really, really acknowledge your comment. And I think, yeah, yeah, it's a key concern, but if we can promote the community to use the biking and cycling, then we won't need to increase the parking now or in future. I, I hear that. <laughs> and Sarah Alma would love to hear that too. Um, I guess just the Asian, it's just whether the Asian population is going to increase at more of a rate than we can convert people to getting out of vehicles. That, that will be your challenge. It would be good to see a bus stop there as well, by the way, once we get our orbiter bus going. <laughs> Me, Jim. Thanks, Madam Chair. Look, I just, just wonder, and I've got no problem with seeing the recommendations in terms of uh, um, not progressing any investigations into additional uh, water going into the lake. But I just wonder, the public, when they read that, could well interpret it, we're not going to be doing anything about the water quality. And I just wonder if we should be thinking about a, a fourth recommendation that um, just references the fact that work is still going on on the treatment of, of the stormwater going into the lake. Um, it might be stating the obvious, but if I just read my initial, when I first read it, I thought, oh, we're not looking at doing anything about the water quality. And I just think we need to let the public know that there is still work being done on um, on treating the stormwater going into the lake. Yeah, I'd endorse that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jeanette has prepared a media release which does mention the water quality. Yeah, so I can, so can ask you to, to boister here, that up if you like. Sort of just to reference it, that, that was the only concern. Yep, okay. So do, are we, do we want to add a, a D there to that effect or are we comfortable with just um, the media release bolstering it? I think Liz, have nice your comment? there was a minute of oh. note. Liz? Yeah. And then, I'm, I'm really keen to actually include... Um, you know, investigating the funding opportunities, as Graham mentioned, with the River Authority and the recommendation. I, I just feel it's such a missed opportunity. There's, was it 7 million annually? Um, just to, you know, I, I ha I'm happy with the recommendations, but there's not enough proactiveness in this for me. I think that Cambridge, um, you know, when you look at the level of submissions that uh, was part of this process and the number of people that engaged on this, we really want to see something happen and it doesn't feel like we're doing enough. So if we can get some extra funding, because that's the only thing that's holding us back right now, um, you know, I think that we could be doing more. So can we include that perhaps in the recommendation to investigate, yeah, the Waikato River or, or put together an application for the Waikato River Authority okay. in the near future? Yeah, so the yeah. next fund, the next funding round, yeah, okay. gives us enough time then. Perhaps it seems to that seems to have found some favour. Yeah. Uh, can we work on doing um, an amended or an additional D? Just through so. the chair, um, it is a great point. We were intending to bring the um, final plan back for final adoption early in the new year, so um, we would take these recommendations through to BOFA. They would uh, make the amendments, and we'd bring back that plan, and they were the sort of additional recommendations we were thinking we would put into that report, but happy to, of course, for them to be included now. Yeah, great. Just in the situation that I talked about with the water being, the wastewater being turfed, rather than have a formal letter to these people, could we have a staff member go and meet with the people that own the, the, the building, the good union? I, 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 quite, I think we can get a buy-in without heavy handedness and a formal letter might not help. I don't know, just, just some thought, just yes. some thought, yeah. Yep, I'm I sure then if there was a follow-up that needed, then that could be more formal, but just in the first instance. Um, yeah, I'll look into that for you and yeah, um, you. email, email yeah. you in the next yeah, few days. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think it's also the additional comments about um, undertaking further work in terms of the um, stormwater um, improvements um, vis -a -vis the water quality. Right. Sorry, um, Roger and then Phil, did you both have something to comment? No, no, no I was just that, endorsing okay. Meg. So if we just... Meg Jim's comments. 
Sam and Anna are waving their magic wands here and working out uh, working up another recommendation there to add. So what we've done is we've amended C as it appears there, but not rather than the full stop. It's we've carried on. Sorry, my eyes are so crap. I'm 48, I can't read that. <laughs> um, so endorse the staff recommendation to not progress any further investigations into the option of flushing the lake to improve its water quality and to progress the water quality improvement actions set out in the concept plan. So that's an addition to that paragraph C. And then there's an, an additional paragraph D, which reads, investigate funding opportunities with the Waikato River Authority. Comfortable with that? Excellent, perfect, thanks Sam. That being the case, do I have no further discussion? Um, Roger, mm -hmm. you're happy to move? Uh, anybody to second? Bruce will second, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Fantastic, thanks very much guys, Thank great work. So this moves us on then to our next agenda item, um, which is the Civil Defence Emergency, Emergency Management Quarterly Report with David Symes. Welcome, David. Oh, it's not jumping. Oh, there we go. Morning, Madam Chair. Morning, Dave. Councillors. Um, so um, the majority of the report can be taken as read. I'll just cover off a few um, key points. Our report's broken into national, regional, and then local um, sectors. Uh, firstly, um, key points around the national um, overview. So a lot of work around tsunami um, sirens or tsunami um, uh, detection equipment um, at a national level um, that continues um, I guess to be um, an issue as to also how we, um, I guess, uh, the public are notified in the event of a, a tsunami, especially on the East Coast. Um, that looks as though most of it's going to be around emergency mobile alerts through cell phones um, over and above the national tsunami um, sirens. So uh, it's not within the report, but I see just released uh, 22nd of November, between six and seven, I guess, the all the emergency mobile alerts for cell phones will be tested. Um, and just on that, um, the emergency mobile alert can actually be localised to small communities as well for um, you know, different types of um, emergency events. Um, around tsunami sirens, um, they've been withdrawn. Uh, FENS uh, previously managed that, but I guess there was an error. Uh, the only one in our particular West Coast area was Kafia. Um, and I guess that's uh, been withdrawn. Um, I also note in their wilding pine controls, so people will say, what's that got to do with civil defence? But we would have seen in oh, how that's around fire, uh, the uh, fire risk. Um, so significant amount of money um, allocated to removing uh, wilding, the wilding um, pines. There's an um, interesting point. TV program on that just mm. over the last couple of days. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, so um, most of the 1.3 million for Waikato has gone to the eastern area, but there is some um, in our in our areas as well. Uh, at a regional level, um, most of the work, and, and I guess we've been included in workshops with local controllers and our welfare managers, um, has um, been around, I guess, uh, COVID resurgence planning that continues, and we're, I guess we're all wary of that, but we all continue to see what's happening overseas. Um, I see uh, Christchurch again just in the last few days had a, a community scare around that. So very prevalent. Um, so that's focused on strength, strengthening uh, Māori iwi relationships. Um, and then looking at our training and I guess um, scalability and our ability to um, continue with a long sustained um, response. 
Um, and and again, again, that would be at level three or level four, whether that's local or uh, a regional response. Certainly, if we were back in level four, it would look like we would be localised uh, to, to how we were um, with individual um, uh, councils being responsible for the response um, at that uh, state of emergency level. At level three, um, it's likely to be a regional response where we would have, um, I guess, outposts to deliver the local um, response through our welfare committees, um, but probably centralised um, at a regional level in the Genesis building, GMO. Um, so also, I guess the uh, at a local level, our civil defence um, shared service agreement was renewed, um, and again, um, uh, the joint uh, response around COVID worked very well for us, but we've um, also um, looked at it, the trigger points as to whether we would manage um, a particular response at a local level or when we would involve all three councils in a combined uh, emergency operations uh, centre. I think Roger has a question for you, Dave. Yeah, please, through you, Madam Chair. I think that's uh, really interesting moving forward. Uh, but did I hear correctly again on the, on the media that in terms of the central government, they're actually having a, a, a plan going forward for next winter and planning for right. a pandemic incursion again during that winter period. Is that coming out through the regions as well? And are you getting involved in that? Or is that just a centralised that strategy would, at this stage yeah most of that would be through health um so i guess our covid resurgence planning has been really around um i guess an outbreak a community outbreak we haven't sort of been had that information through to next winter or okay. or the likelihood of uh, whether it be a different strain or, or whatever um but i think i guess the learnings coming from overseas um and uh, the fact that it's a long-term event and what does um, a regional or a local lockdown look like, that's where most of our planning the indications are would be regional, similar to Auckland. Um, and I guess for that, it's actually what's the most pragmatic approach in terms of our boundaries for uh, Waikato region. Uh, bearing in mind, we go from the tip of the Coromandel down to Taupo, all the way to Mokau, so it's a significant uh, geographical area to, to manage. And that we don't do that alone, we do that with emergency services, mm -hmm. police and health. Um, so that's yeah, certainly part of, um, I guess, um, our readiness. Um, and with, in terms of response, we actually moved um, two adverse uh, weather events late September, which uh, warranted the standing up of the Regional Council flood room. Um, they passed through uh, quite quickly. There was, um, I guess, some flooding in the um, Waitomo region uh, that we responded to, but other than that, uh, no uh, significant uh, damage, fortunately. Um, and probably the only other thing which um, is of note uh, through yesterday was the changing of the name with regards to the Ministerial Portfolio for Civil Defence. So that's now changed to uh, Emergency Management, which reflects the review in 2018 of a move, it's just another step towards the move of rebranding Civil Defence to Emergency uh, Management. So no, um, I guess, uh, financial or uh, impacts around rebranding for us at a local level yet, but um, I guess that, that that will evolve uh, eventually. The only other thing um, in the report is around recovery. Um, through, Matt, uh, through you, Madam Chair, perhaps Debbie uh, would like to comment on that, just with the work that's going on there, which is uh, for us is focused on COVID recovery, really. Um, so as you will have read in the report, we are making some quite good progress on recovery. Um, I think it's probably fair to say, though, that we're, we're still waiting um, to see what the full extent of the impacts will be on COVID-19. So um, at this stage, we're um, spending most of our time relationship building with some of the other agencies that are galvanising to do work in this space and looking at what we can kind of line up. So um, been meeting with iwi regularly, um, meeting with MSD, meeting with Tawaka, um, um, keeping in contact with the community organisations that are based in Te Aumaru and Cambridge, um, just to keep on top of what's happening there and um, 
yeah, doing what we can. So um, we have appointed two community advisors. They start on the 9th of November and um, I'll send an email out this afternoon just um, introducing those two new staff. Um, so really looking forward to getting them on board. I think there's um, plenty of work for them to be doing. Um, yeah, but happy to take any questions. 9th of November. Um, Dave, just a question getting back to tsunami towers. Um, I just wonder why, where fins are coming from. I know we've all got cell phones, but when if you actually heard what when they go off, and they're totally different to a fire situation <laughs> in the Sintamid, and they just don't stop, mm. and they're all in place on the East Coast. Mm. I just wonder where they're coming from, really, because they, they, I've, I've experienced one, and it, it's effective. Yes. You know, I don't know whether the cell phone will have the same mm. effect, but... Move on, I know. Mm, and I think uh, the difficulty around, especially up around uh, Thames Coromandel, was a lot of those communities fundraised or funded those uh, local tsunami sirens. And um, uh, but I, I think uh, some of it, from Fens's perspective, um, as I understand it, is there were varying um, degrees of uptake, and then not all of the sirens were the same. So um, people, you know, the public became confused. Um, but certainly some pushback in those areas uh, where they've been uh, extremely effective and where there's such a short um, time frame for the notification of uh, a major earthquake, a tsunami on its way and having to move to higher ground. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other question for Dave? No. That being so, we have a recommendation there on page 53, just simply to receive your report. Mike's happy to move it. Clear, second. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dave. Thank you very Always much. interesting. Cheers. That brings us through to morning tea. So we will adjourn and come back at um, 10.35. <laughs>
agenda, next agenda item, which is the quarterly district growth report. All right, good morning, uh, good morning. Your Worship um, and councillors, Madam Chair. Uh, so uh, Kirsty and I do a bit of team tag on this one. Um, so the quarterly district growth reports, so this is for the period 1 July 2020 uh, to 30 September uh, 2020. Um, so includes matters arising at national, regional, sub-regional district uh, levels. Kirsty is just going to go through um, initially the national, sub-regional and, and district levels, and then I'll follow through the rest of the report. So take from there. Um, kia ora koutou. So just assuming that you've read the report, I'll just highlight some, some key points. In relation to the submission at a national level, that has been led by the transportation team. Um, and I understand that was presented to and discussed with the Service Delivery Committee. Um, that submission will be lodged um, to ensure that we comply with the time frame this week. At a sub-regional level, so in relation to the Hamilton Waikato Spatial Plan, um, David Topman will be reporting to this committee in December and providing you um, with an update. In terms of the housing preference study, um, so a memorandum has been prepared and that will be provided to you in the Friday mail out. Um, and if you have any questions arising from that, um, if you direct those directly to David and or myself. Um, with regard to the proposed national policy statement on urban development, um, we will be providing a status update um, at SPMP in December. So you'll note there that um, that the final report is due by the completion of the calendar year. So um, we may not have the substantive um, report to present to you, but we'll provide an update and, and um, let you know where we're at in terms of that. With regard to Nahanapodi village concept plans, so you'll recall that we'd previously um, had you approve for us to commence um, public consultation. And then following that endorsement, um, we were contacted by a key landowner within the Nahanapodi area um, and they had themselves undertaken some work with professional advisors and so we've been endeavouring to work with them and also with the community organisation and the school together with Ministry um, of Education. We've actually got a follow-up meeting with the the key landowner and their advisors scheduled to occur tomorrow. So in terms of the update, that was correct at the point that this report was prepared, um, but it does mean that we'll be looking at pushing out the recommencement of that public consultation process until such time as we've got a, an agreed understanding um, with the key landowner and then going back to the community group. So we're probably looking at December now. We have got a holding place on the agenda for SPMP in December. And the other um, documents there, you're familiar that approval or endorsement has been provided in relation to Pirongia Village Concept Plan Refresh. And we're just um, hoping to finalise the design work so that that um, document can be made available in its final form and available um, on our website. And we'll ensure that, like we did with Cambridge Town Concept Plan Refresh, that we provide um, you with that information also in C4 Structure Plan. Um, has been endorsed also. Um, Justine has been working with the Parks and Reserves team um, to ensure that there is contact and discussion underway in relation to the Motocross Club and, um, and you know, the future relocation of that entity. And also there have been some queries that have come out from landowners, particularly in the Silverwood Lane area, following the endorsement. So just working through them, we're looking to engage with them um, obviously outside the, the formal process that is now concluded. I'm so happy to respond to any questions. Right, so just um, carrying on through the report, I'm just going to touch on various aspects. As I say, there's quite a lot of detail in this report, so uh, really just take it as read. Um, in terms of the um, district uh, planning development implementation, so you've previously been advised around, around the e-plan and uh, uh, the e-plan has been now tendered, so uh, we're going through that, that process. Uh, in terms of national directions and RMA reform, so uh, Tony and the team are working through the requirement to remove the car parking um, requirements from the district plan. Um, 
So there'll be no consultation process as a national policy statement, but we are so also taking in, uh, following on the recommendations um, from the development contributions policy meetings to incorporate some opportunity to recover costs for public car parking. Um, we'll just have to wait and see how the RMA uh, review process goes with the Anderson report now with the new government. I'm sure there'll be changes that will come through um, and we'll keep you updated on those. Uh, the plan changes, so you've got a whole suite of um, reports uh, in your agenda um, following this, um, this presentation relating to various plan changes. And Tony and the team will go through those uh, with PC15, permeable services, PC16, technical improvements, PC18, beekeeping. Uh, there's an update on the private plan change, T2, which is um, the uh, proposed retirement village and residential development. And also an update on PC19, the Cambridge Industrial Commercial Workshop. So they're all on your SPMP agenda. And as you know, the PC13, we've just delayed the notification of, of that just to ensure that we get correct correlation between what we're uplifting and the structure plan requirements. Uh, in the report, um, we highlight um, <clears throat> from the development engineering team what's going on in the infrastructural development area, um, particularly relating to the infrastructure requirements and the growth cells. The uh, resource consent, so Appendix 2 has details about the major resource consent applications, and that includes um, the application by Shores Property Holdings for a sand quarry at 928 Kaipaki Road. Um, submissions have been received and we've scheduled for a hearing with the Regulatory Committee on the 23rd of November. Um, also, I do note that um, Festival 1, um, the event, um, uh, activity. The resource consent hearing has been delayed at the request of the applicants. So um, following the receipt of the council's report that um, had raised a number of issues um, given the submissions that were lodged, um, they've delayed the hearing on that matter. Um, in terms of resource consent numbers, um, they've been increasing during this quarter. We had 79 land use, uh, 55 in the last quarter and 51 subdivisions, 38 in the last quarter. Of course, it was COVID um, situation. So um, you know, there would have probably been a downturn in the last quarter, but um, certainly um, good, uh, good bounce back in the applications and all processed in statutory timeframe. In addition to the limbs applicate, limb numbers, um, so we had a substantial increase in the last quarter, 344 we completed compared to 152 in the last quarter. It's a substantial increase and all processed within the statutory timeframes at about 5.96 working day average. Building compliance, um, building consent applications numbers have been quite resilient, um, I have to say, um, post COVID-19 lockdown. Consent numbers are showing a steady increase in building applications um, being submitted to previous years. The new applications are a mix of commercial and residential, a slight increase in the commercial work from a comparison with the 2019 um, quarter. Um, so in terms of the numbers, we had 491 building consents lodged. It's a value of 117 million over that quarter. Uh, it's an increase of 59 building consents um, submitted from the same period 2019. <clears throat> in terms of issued building consents, 342 building consents issued, valued 94 million, and that includes 106 new dwellings. And there's a table in the report that just indicates a split between um, across the district. So you can get an idea of where the, the housing has been promoted. Some of those ones that are lodged are still in the process? Yes. Yeah, process. so yeah, so lodged it might be still subject to information requests, right. um, issued as yeah, the it, it is what it is, it's issuing of building consents. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chair, monitoring Wayne, sorry, sorry madam. Yes. <laughs> madam Chair, can I can I ask a question? <laughs> no, no, that's all right. <laughs> Wayne, I got, I just, you might not know the answer to this, if somebody will, I got a call from people who've got a new house and in their plan, which was approved by council, they were putting in an Essia gas fire. They changed their mind and put a Renai in and according to them, council charged them $250 to alter that. Would that be correct? Or is that a building permit 
addition. I just wanted to clarify that. I couldn't argue with them. Yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, perhaps if, perhaps if um, I can follow that through, um, uh, you know, off, uh, uh, offline, I guess, in terms of this report. Um, but certainly every time we get a building consent or an alteration, we do get charged um, costs associated with the alpha system. So even as an alteration, we will incur a cost. Um, for the minor applications though, um, they, they don't pay as much as say, you know, houses and those sorts of things. So I'll just need to come back to you um, if you know, if you give me the details and I can confirm the costs associated with that processing. Okay. So just um, for Following on the, the monitoring and enforcement side, so the section seven in the report, um, comment, commenting on the monitoring and enforcement activity. So importantly, we're um, securing additional resource um, to increase the levels of enforcement, um, particularly as it relates to parking enforcement. Um, it's obviously been a, uh, an issue around the <coughs> council table here. So parking enforcement, so we're not doing warrants and regos um, as directed by the Council, but um, just uh, been um, more observant um, about those time limits associated with the CBD. And uh, rubbish dumping has been a real key issue here as well. So we have talked about, about that. Um, in terms of rubbish dumping, excuse, excuse me, just through the chair, just the rubbish. Oh, sorry, no, actually, carry on. Sorry. Right. So, um, in terms of rubbish dumping, um, you <laughs> probably whether I'm going to preempt that question, but anyway, note um, you may have noted on a, on on 27th of October we did a press release um, about five offenders were issued $400 fines um, for illegally dumping rubbish in Waipa. So we had members of the public who are filming um, filming illegal dumping and passing this information on to our enforcement team. Um, examples are a person was filmed, public, filmed um, tipping rubbish out of the, uh, or, yeah, out on the side of a Regan Road in a helpo um, from a trailer. Uh, members of the public saw uh, in Prongia witness rubbish being thrown out of the car, so photos were taken of the vehicle and the litter. For Papa South, we had persons um, were captured on security cameras dropping off seven boxes of jib sheets off cuts and there was dump rubbish on Peak Road and behind shops in George Street and Te Amuru. So all of those offences, we were managed to track them down and issue $400 um, infringement notices associated with that. We do think the infringement notice penalty is quite low, um, but that's what the Parliament has set um, in regard to that. Um, and in anticipation of the question, it might be about the rubbish point um, points update, but <laughs> uh, so I did ask, um, Carl Tutty, an update in regard to how we're going and um, implementing the council direction in regard to that. So our tactics are that um, firstly we needed the additional resource, so we're going through and getting that um, further enforcement officer to be employed in conjunction with Waitomo District on a part-time basis um, to look at both, as I say, rubbish, rubbish, illegal rubbish dumping and um, parking enforcement. But our our plan in terms of these rubbish points update is uh, we do a mail drop in the area concerned, we're going to do press releases, we're increasing the signage. We'll start with the most problematic site, so we're not going to try and do all the sites at once. Um, we'll set a date to end its use, um, we'll notify Enviro Waste and then we'll move on to the next site and learn from, from any uh, any matters associated with that. So. That's what I've got. The, that you, you know, it's in Parliament that you can't increase it from 400. Is that right? That's correct. Because that's that's what my comment is. People have said that's pathetic. How if you if, if you double it, that's been stupid. But people would think, oh, you know. yeah. I know the wow. parliament par parliamentarians have considered the issue, um, but there has been no agreement to increase that level of uh, litter fee. So through the chair, um, with regards to security cameras, how many are you? suggested that you use those on the sites. How many cameras have we got? We've probably got uh, I don't have an update in relation to security cameras on those rubbish point um, locations. Um, yeah, we do, uh, we are getting additional, and I'll come on to it, um, additional security cameras at our animal control pounds. 
through you, Madam Chair. Um, understand the, the uh, legislative control on fines, but is there another tack that we can take by charging them for costs regarding the cleanup of the mess that they were instrumental in? And I mean, that could increase their payment yeah. to us. Uh, yes, so that's a real good question. Actually, I was thinking about that just before this meeting. Uh, I didn't get an answer. I actually haven't gone and asked Carl about that um, because I, my thoughts would be if we had found out that, for example, the, the person that dumped all the jib, um, that we have directed them to go and clean it up and issue the no, notice of infringement. I just can't confirm that that occurred um, rather than us going to clean up and yep. issue the notice of infringement, but I would anticipate and I can come back and just confirm mm. whether we are directing those folk, particularly the, the fly tipping, and we find out that they go in and clean up their own rubbish rather than us having to incur those costs. And I'll come back to you on that question. Um, <clears throat> just my question was, can you just elaborate a little bit more on what direction we're giving to the waste management folks that are normally pick up rubbish? And at this stage, they probably are picking up illegal rubbish. What direction have we given them? Yeah, um, probably a little bit out of, uh, in terms of the detail, um, but I, I'd imagine Carl will be working with Enviro Waste um, to confirm that what what exactly we're doing in terms of the enforcement activity associated with those um, collection points. So we just need to be working closely with them. Um, so I'm not aware of any specific direction at this time. Um, I can come back to you on what uh, what the commentary will be to Enviro Waste, but it'll be essentially um, these sites will be um, no longer uh, approved or um, allowable for Enviro Waste to collect these these uh, these bags up. So that will be really good just to get some feedback because at the moment, probably at the goodness of their heart, they still are. And I know it's going to create a short term issue for the local yeah. community in these areas when the bags build up. But yeah, okay. uh, yeah. Right. Um, so just cracking on. Um, asked a question about the, um, the the yellow rubbish bags. Are they still going to be available to ordinary householders? So it's just the rubbish points that you're doing the enforcement on? Um, so I'm down in my area. I'm sorry, Claire. I don't know it that one. It was discussed in our workshop, but that wasn't sort of resolved. Yeah. Hey, Wayne, sorry, I know, sorry, I know we're harping on about this, but I guess the other thing is, is these illegal spots are illegal, but sometimes only four or five, three hundred metres down the road, because where people put their rubbish out, they don't own the land, it's council land. So is there anything, you know, anything to stop you from putting your rubbish bag alongside someone else's who's got a legitimate pickup? Because, I mean, I mean, it's... It's it's still council land. I know they mow it and all the rest of it, but yeah. that is much better option than them dumping it in piles. Well, I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. I, look, I, I agree that you should be putting it outside your own property boundary. Your own property, then yeah. you know. I, I'm just taking Thornton Road, for instance. It's all dumped, but if they're probably going down Thornton Road anyway, if they dumped it, you might annoy the landowner who owns the you know, a house there, but they actually are still on council land. It would then get picked up legally in a yellow bag. It's just a legal option and opportunity for these guys to do the right thing. And it might be one more bag outside someone's house, but it's going to be collected anyway. I think the one of the, the one of the biggest issues is like the ones at Carapero, the residents say there, it's not so much them leaving the rubbish the day before the collection. It's leaving the rubbish four or five days before the collection. Yeah. And if they leave it at someone's letterbox, they might leave it there four or five days. There's probably no problem leaving it there the day of collection or the night before. But yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's like, that that's correct. And indeed, you know, one once somebody starts leaving rubbish out somebody else's house, then you get another you might end up getting another collection point. <laughs> so um, yeah. <laughs> And I think Carapero is going to be one of our first sites. Yeah, I had uh, when we lived in Lamb Street, I we had um, a lady at Rotorangi who I asked me if she could put her bag at front of my gate. Didn't have an issue with it, but she had chicken bones and stuff. Yeah. And that night, the bloody cats got into it or the dogs. <laughs> and I 
you know, yeah. long story short, I asked to not to put it there anymore, but that's what happens. Oh, you know, the person there is left picking up the, the pieces. Mm -hmm. But, but is, isn't this ultimately a res the responsibility of residents with Enviro Waste? It's not really council responsibility, is it? So, I mean, if you've got an area like Karapiro or other areas that are currently not part of Enviro Waste's, you know, area then it's up to those residents to start lobbying enviro waste for that service but are they are those residents undertaking any activities you know to themselves sort of being self-responsible about it all i mean so yeah but it, but it should be to enviro waste because it's not actually, it's, it's, an, it's a commercial arrangement between a resident and a, and a company. We're nobody in the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's because something I've noticed, and it was something that I was really clear about it when we had that workshop, was that it starts here, but then it creeps out. And even, I mean, I'm out at Puahui, and I'm noticing people on Park Road, for goodness sake, putting bags out. I mean, that's well off the beaten track, and they're, they're, still, sitting, they're still sitting there. So, yeah. you know, you allow, you allow something, and then before you know it, there's an expectation that every bit, if it's okay for those people who live in a rural area, then I can do it too. And yeah, it just creates but a hell of a mess. That's exactly what's happening at Karapiro because on the hydro road there, they get rubbish collection. You put your bag at your letterbox, but it's people from Horahora, even Horahora Road towards Arapuni, which is not even our district, who go to Cambridge or Hamilton to work and drop the bag off on the way through. So, so we'll we'll follow through on uh, giving you an update, probably a Friday mail out update about which site we're going. For. First, I'm pretty sure it's the Carapiro site and what we're doing, so um, you're, you're informed in that regard. Uh, just, just cracking through the report, and just now I'm conscious of time. Um, so the animal control update, so total number of calls, comparable with the same quarter as last year, types of complaints, we had barking complaints double compared to the last quarter and increase from the same from the previous year, and that's probably expected, um, increased due to the end of the COVID-19 um, Lockdown, so people are leaving their dogs more, you know, more at home. And previously in COVID, they were they were at home and walking their dogs. Um, rushing complaints have increased compared to the same um, quarter last year. We had five dog bites on people. Um, one dog seized, recommend uh, remanded, sorry, remained unclaimed and was subsequently euthanized. One was um, classified as menacing. One in process of being. Um, signed over to council. One owner received education and made property changes. Um, one attack went, wasn't able to be verified. Numbers of dogs on our database um, increased another 10 from the report. So just got an update this morning. We're at 8,849. Um, so checked on the registration rates and we're at 96.4%. Um, so 8,527 dogs registered. So about three. Yeah, 3.6%, still um, 322 dogs that we're still uh, following through on. Uh, 10 dogs have been rehomed from the 17 that um, were not claimed by their owners and the local charity Pound uh, Hounds Rescue Charity Charitable Trust has been assisting in that regard for us. The, um, and as I indicated, we're investigating placing security cameras on our two pounds following theft of dogs um, in recent months. Uh, just environmental health, uh, numbers of food premises are increasing, we're at 315 now, it's 294 previous quarter. And numbers of premises for alcohol and health registrations remains pretty much on par with the previous quarter. Uh, and on table on page 12, the report highlights the numbers of various premises um, associated with the um, different activities on license, off license club, health license, food premises. Uh, smoke and noise complaints reduced to the previous compared to the previous quarter. Nuisance complaints increased by 11. Noise directions is issued increased by 14. The district licensing committee processed and approved 110 applications. No hearings were required. Um, and as you may know, there's a new bottle store application received for 451 Alexander Street, Taumuru, top end of the CBD there. Um, currently being processed, I posed by Police Medical Office of Health, and there's 15 objections from the public as well. So it's in process, scheduled for hearing. Um, 
the appendices contained all the <clears throat> info supporting information. So um, just leave that with you to read. Um, other than that, the recommendation is for the report to be received under section two. Happy to second. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Carried. Oh, sorry, against. Carried. Thank you for your very thorough report. Now, moving on to um, our next item, which is plan change 15 permeable surfaces. Approval to notify. And we have Julie and Tony for that. Good morning. Um, morning everyone. So um, we have four reports before you on plan changes. So three of them, um, so 15, 16 and 18, three of them are for approval to notify. And the fourth one, which is uh, for plan change 12, has already been notified under Wayne's delegated authority, so it's a private plan change. Um, through you, Madam Chair, just wondering if you'd like us to take you through these each individually, we can summarise the high points. Um, and then if there's any questions or discussions um, and take the reports as read, would you be happy with that approach? Okay. Um, and just, just a reminder for the members who are accredited commissioners as well, that you may be hearing some of these plan changes. Um, so just a, just a bit of caution around any comments that um, might come out around the merits of them. So I'll hand over to Julie, who will just summarize through plan change 15. Thank you, Tony. Good morning, Madam Chair, and good morning, councillors. Um, you may remember that we've been through these topics several times now. So this is the, um, the uh, Section 32 evaluation report that we're required to do under the Resource Management Act, which is like our um, evaluation and justification for how we arrived at a plan change and what particular text we might include in it. So proposed plan change 15 is about permeable and impermeable services. Um, we, I think, I'm not sure, can't quite remember how um, the, how much of the proposed text was in front of you last time, but there are some changes to the rules um, that we're proposing, putting out for a submission, uh, and mainly around the category of consent for impermeable surfaces. So you might remember that in particular in the Cambridge North area, we get lots and lots of consent applications to breach the permeable surfaces rules. Invariably, like 99% of them are approved because they've um, given a satisfactory engineering solution to the stormwater disposal issue they have there. So we were looking to just reduce the category of consent so it doesn't cost our applicants so much every time they, they come in. So that's the main thrust of the permeable and impermeable services. I've tidied up a few other little rules along the way, like site coverage and that. Or um, And the other thing is we've looked close, more closely at the definitions because one of the main issues the consent planners identified with them was that they didn't align very well. So tried to do that. We've done a um, fair bit of consultation with stakeholders, so mainly mainly the house building companies, they're the ones who are putting in the building and resource consent applications all the time. So they came back with a few suggestions, but we're on the whole quite happy with the direction of it. Mm. Sure, yeah, yeah. So would you have preferred like a separate thing just saying here are the changes, easily to see? Yep. Sure, yeah, yeah. I think we've just sort of stuck to what we have to legally do, but yeah, I'll bear that in mind for next time. That's a good suggestion. Here, here they are, you can see them easily, sure. Um, so if there are no questions on that, I'm happy to move on to plan change 16. I just wanted to check, Claire, was your query that you raised by email addressed? Well, they're just, yeah, I raised just a few really minor things, but yeah, but I'm happy for you to decide if you make any changes to it. Or sure. Not. If you like, I did have a question about, I think the maximum coverage yeah. and, and how it's yeah. expressed. Because I, when I first read it, I thought, I'm not sure whether or not it means it's automatically um, deducted, yeah. uh, or or is it actually relates to the maximum? Yeah. So yes. yeah, that's what I was just confused. Yeah. But, yeah. But I'm happy for you to decide what to do. Thank you. Um, 
Councillor, yes, I have been and had a look, and yes, I am um, embarrassed to admit I've been caught out with some grammatical errors. But, <laughs> um, but yes, that one, I'm happy to have another look at that, and it may be that it even makes sense to take that whole bit out and just rely on, here's the 40%, that's what we're doing. So um, happy to have another look at it, for sure. Um, plan change 16. So did we want... To move each one as you go through? I think it would yes. be sensible too, yes. Yeah. So we have um, recommendation there appearing on pages 138 and 139 to not only receive your report, but also to resolve to receive the report um, incorporating the section 32 evaluation and then resolve to notify and also resolve to um, delegate that authority um, to make changes if necessary as a result of ongoing consultation with EWI other stakeholders. So that's A, B, C and D. Have I got anybody who's happy to move that? Mike, Lou will second. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Great, so then we'll move on to the next item, then the plan change 16. Uh, yes, so this one is the one with the minor technical improvements. Um, and I think, as I recall last time, you were mainly happy with everything, but there was a discussion about the outdoor living area. Yeah. Um, and I had made, um, Claire, you brought to my attention that I hadn't transferred the new rule to the end part of the report. So, yes, um, we decided in the end that it was good to just take out that whole uh, location aspect of the outdoor living area and um, that would mean that people who didn't want to sit in the sun all day could have their outdoor living area anywhere on their property and it'd be slightly smaller. Apart from that there was there were no other changes so just as a reminder it was about um, glazing, uh, facades, they mainly related to um, garages standalone garages that were being built after a house. On oh, the other main thing was the water supply for fire fighting. So we discussed about putting in a rule with some specific um, requirements around water and that was to test our submission process and see who would come back. So um, I think Tony suggested to you that if we just took out the rule, we'd only get a submission from FENS if we put it in, we'd get broader submissions and that, you know, you could make your decision at a later stage. Okay, so does anybody have any questions or queries for Tony and Julie on this one? Everybody's happy with that? Okay, so similarly on page um, 205, we have recommendations mirroring the earlier ones to um, accept, um, to receive the report, to resolve to receive the report with the section 32 evaluation and then the subsequent um, paragraphs C and D. Can it, Graham's happy to move, do I have a seconder? Jim, yeah Jim, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Fantastic, so that moves us on then to plan change 18, the beekeeping one. Excuse Bye me. Julie. <laughs> <laughs> Simone. Welcome Simone. Yeah, I think you all know Simone. Um, yep. So if, if you can just take me through the yep. high points. Good morning. So um, plan change 18 is um, relating to beekeeping in the residential zone and the large lot residential zones. Um, so uh, through this council um, wants to make it easier for people to have beekeeping activities within these zones because at the moment, um, it's any type of beekeeping activity requires resource consent. Um, we've received a bit of feedback that there is uh, quite a few of unregistered or unconsented hives in these areas already. So obviously there's an issue uh, around this. Um, so we have um, come up with some options on how to address this and how we can change these four options. And um, this has gone to some key stakeholders for feedback through the issues and options. Um, and the general consensus is it's evenly split between two of those options. So there's uh, no major concerns or um, need for change, I guess, in terms of the section 32. Um, yeah, any questions? Thank you for that. We've been over this quite a bit, but does anybody have any further question or comment to make? Mike? 
comment that um that residential and large lot there was no differentiation between just two beehives mm. and i mean you know one section can be sort of 400 squares the other can be 10,000 squares mm. just rationale for that well generally two beehives um, can consist of you know quite a few boxes you know eight to ten boxes per beehive so um, I guess it kind of takes it from more of a hobbyist activity to up to two beehives to more of a commercial activity so that's kind of what we are um, controlling a little bit but um, through one of the options particularly option four allows for you know if someone is in a unique situation um, and wants to seek to apply for more um, beehives they could through a resource consent process yeah it would be a, considered on its individual merits so yeah great there being no further questions again on page 275 and 76 we've got similar um, recommendations there to receive report to resolve to receive so on and so forth Lou and Bruce, all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thank you very much. Thank you. So that very speedily moves us on to the private plan change 12, appearing on page 318 of our agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. So um, you recall this is a private plan change um, that was outsourced to processing by Place Group. Um, so it's a relatively straightforward run in the way. It, it's uh, an existing deferred residential zone the plan change is seeking to bring forward that zoning, so uplifting the deferment, so it's not actually rezoning it per se, uplifting the deferment, um, tweaking some of the rules to allow for rest home, and rest home is a residential activity as well, so there's no significant change there. And um, just, just massaging, I suppose, some of the rules particular to that site to enable the development. So it's relatively straightforward. Um, it has been notified, it was notified on October the 30th, so this is a form information report um, under Wayne's delegated authority, he authorised that notification. We're expecting it to go through relatively straightforward. So this is just a full information report, but happy to take any questions on that. Anybody have any questions for Tony on that one? No? Do you have a comment that I think the concern is um, likely to be anti-competitive uh, objections. So. Uh, but that's just going to be a challenge to work through. But uh, yeah, I don't know that we can take any account of that, but it's going to be, a, uh, there's a risk, I think, that it will actually be challenged. Thank you for that, you wish it. Um, there is a mechanism in the RMA where any trade competition um, can't be taken into account. So if we do get submissions like that, that and they can be presented I've seen them presented in a, in a way that they are clearly trade competition, often between supermarkets, but they're presented in a way that they're not. So that becomes quite clear through the submission process. So we can manage that, but thank you for the heads up. Great. Right. So no, no further comments. So we have um, just a recommendation there to receive your report. Have somebody move that for me, please. So, and I'm happy to second. So all those in favour say aye. aye. Against, carried. Thanks. Thank Tony. you. Okay, so on to our next item, which is the sewer pipe renewals appearing on page. I'll go back to my agenda here. 336, and we should, are we ahead of time here? Yeah, we're very ahead. Oh, we're well ahead, aren't we? We're powering through, so is James not around? Oh, look at us go. Can we, I suppose, Ken's not here either. We can't juggle the... What? Oh. Do you know how far away he may be? Oh, we're well ahead, aren't we? Supposed to be at twelve oh five. I've just sent a message. And, um, okay. See if you can get Ken. Yeah, I've got Ken. Okay. Well, how about we just adjourn for five minutes until we try and find somebody to come talk to us.
the talk button. So this item is the sewer pipe renewal, and it's all appearing up on page 336 of our agenda. Um, we have the report. Welcome, James. Just the talk button. There's a little bluish colored blue. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Right. Um, so sorry, I've come over here in a rush. Um, this uh, report is just for increasing the approved contract sum for Zora Neal's contract um, by about $2,000-ish um, on this $1.2-ish million dollar contract. Um, we went over cost, uh, mostly due to COVID. My question was that uh, it's such a small amount, don't you have a plus and minus for? for that you could go within uh, reason, five grand or something? Yeah, that's uh, that's where we get to with our approved contract okay. sum. Um, unfortunately, we are just slightly over the approved contract sum <coughs> and there is no um, intermediate. There's just you either are over or you are. Oh, right. So we, we owe the contract a certain amount of money and to pay them that money, we need to have this approved. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Okay, so who moved that? Mike, Mike moved it. Lou seconded it. Any further discussion? No? All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thanks, James. Is Ken here? He's here. Oh, look, he's hiding. Um, so our next item is a report on, um, on the September 2020 Audit and Risk Committee meeting. Morning, Ken.
Thanks, Ken. Any questions? Um, Mike, then Roger. Hey, Ken, just a question with regards to some of the feedback and the observations um, in terms of the IT setup at home for staff. Um, with the you know, possibility that we have another regional lockdown or, or staff are working from home, yeah. what, what have we put in place as an organisation to sort of help the IT at home where there's deficiencies? Right, okay. So, uh, so Is this on? It's not on. Um, yeah, what we've got in place there is, um, yeah, mo a quite a number of our staff um, have got um, have got laptops um, available to them. So, so work supplied um, laptops, which actually was, um, yeah, we rolled those out in the very um, the early stages of, um, yeah, of the of the of the lockdown. Um, yeah, we'd actually, um, yeah, we'd actually bought, um, I think, about one hundred and ten of them um, just in the lead up to um, to, to lockdown. So, um, yeah, so uh, so our, our staff, I would suggest, are. Uh, uh, fairly mobile in, in that regard. Um, I know that some of the issues that we got was, um, yeah, was um, you know, staff are, are used to obviously larger monitors or perhaps some um, dual monitors if they're if they're having to do a lot of comparison um, type work on on you know you know multiple screens. Um, so that was a bit of a limitation. And during that lockdown period, we did have some staff coming coming into work and actually taking that stuff home um, while, while they were while they were at, at home and even things like keyboards etc. Um, I know we were looking to um to work with some um potentially with some local suppliers in terms of staff um potentially getting discount if they wanted to um yeah you know to buy um additional monitors and keyboards um for home use um so 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 yeah so council wouldn't actually be contributing to that cost but um yeah looking to looking to um work up supplier arrangements that enable them to to do that mentions mobile phones so i, I guess that's phones and data um yeah, just any comments on there whether we've made any provisions around yeah. additional data for staff or yeah, so I think um, actually I think during the um, during the actual crisis, some um, a lot of the telecommunications companies came came on stream in terms of unlimited data. Um, so I don't remember that being a real um, a real um, difficulty. Um, and again, a number of our staff do have um, yeah do, do have mobile mobile phones. Council supplied mobile phones. Um, that's a pooled um, a pooled um, data thing. Um, so yeah, so a lot of our staff do have access to that if they if they really need it. But 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 actually, I think a lot of people, even in their own personal homes, do um yeah do have unlimited data these um these days anyway, or, or certainly um, big amounts of data that yeah that that it's uh, yeah as, as far as I'm aware, that's never really been an issue. Mm. Thank you, Graham. Ken, just um the audit and risk is a very very important committee within council. Mm -hmm. um, do you think? that when we have recommendations that audit and risk, that we should run the recommendations over our legal representative so that we get it correct. Because I, th I think it's that important that that okay. wouldn't do any harm. Now, I'm, I'm, I don't know about any other committee, but for legals, you know, they kind of need to be right. Otherwise, you know, it, it sort of falls back to the council being incompetent and we're not Sue is she's a legal lady, but and and um, also we have um, what Prongia, no, yeah, clear okay. eagle, eagle eyed as well. Yes. But I just wondered if that was a, a, a procedure you could um, oh, okay. we could go through. Just it's just a suggestion. Yes. Yep. Okay, so, so 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 sorry. Um, so through the chair. So you're referring to the the fact it was saying that council adopt this rather than rather than SPP. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look. Um. Yeah. I mean. You know. Certainly, feedback taken on taken on board. And, and actually, I think that was actually populated when this was due to go to council rather than rather than this committee. Like I say, it is unusual that it's come to this committee. Um. But yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. And to, you know. Um. Yeah. The governance team and and legal do um do check some of these reports. It's a it's a little bit um, risk-based, and this, this, yeah, perhaps, perhaps that, you know, perhaps I, I would suggest that's a relatively, relatively minor error that we, you know, we have, we have picked up. Yeah. Yes, yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. No. Certainly, certainly, feedback um, taken. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Feedback taken. The feedback taken on board. <laughs> 
Roger. Press your button, Roger. Sorry. Yeah, which I think is worthwhile. When uh, Mike was asking about the change in the working environment and the move to um, home-based um, laptop and tablet work, it was acknowledged that there was an increase in cyber security risk. Yes. In, and it's reflected in uh, that risk number four, that obviously it does increase that cyber security mm -hmm. risk, which we need to be aware of. Yes, look, look, that is certainly, um, certainly true. Um, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those guys who cause some um, trouble in this, in the, you know, in the cybersecurity field, um, yeah, you know, saw that as a, as a real opportunity with, yeah. um, yeah, worldwide, um, yeah, you know, people working from home, and and we did have some instances where where staff did click on links that they shouldn't have clicked on, um, so um, yeah, th those were those were dealt to pretty quickly by our um by our IT team, and yeah, you know, no no significant damage done, but um, yeah, but they. That certainly was a, a risk um, during that during that period, um, because uh, the the people who do that stuff realise that um, organisations would be a lot more vulnerable during during that time. Right. So, does anybody else have a question or a comment for Ken at all before we address the recommendation? No. Okay. So we have that recommendation there with that slight change in terms of B and C. Um, I'm happy to move from the chair. Can I have a seconder? Clear. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Fantastic. Great, thank you. Because we're so speedy, we thought we'd bring ahead the um, public excluded matter. Um, before lunch, because our lunch isn't there. <laughs> oh, it is there now? Okay, so I guess, <laughs> so we're moving.